God bless you this morning. We are so excited that you are joining us this morning. I want you to know that God has something special for your life. And if you have somebody right there next to you, I want you to look over them and tell them, God has something special for you. God has something special for you. And make sure you tell everybody right there with you. Because God has something special for each and every one of us this morning. The Bible says that better is one day in his house than a thousand courts away. And with that verse, we know that today is a great day. Today is the best day. Because though we are all in our separate homes, as we come together in unity, we are all in the house of the Lord. Your house is the house of the Lord. And I just want you right there where you are to say, Holy Spirit, welcome into my home. Welcome into my family. Welcome right here this morning. Welcome into my heart. God, I want you to set a fire inside of my soul. Set a fire inside of my soul as I seek more of your presence this morning. As I seek to be before your throne. Exalting the name above all names. Singing a new song this morning. Singing an anthem to the Lord that God is faithful and he is good. We worship you. There is 
true, you are true. Even in my wondering, you are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I see. You are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. How about we all just sing this? I'm ready.
Lord, we become just, we come before your presence. Yes, Lord. Your word says, he who seeks me earnestly shall find me. Thank you. Thank you. And we believe that this morning, that as we draw close to you, you reveal yourself to us. King, go back to the beginning. King, control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be. you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again meet me here again I want more of you how about we sing these words as I walk as I walk now through the valley let your love rise above every fear like the sun like the sun shape in the shadow in my weakness your glory appears. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I Cause all I want, cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Meet me here again. Lord, I want to see you. I need you. For a minute, not for a minute, was I forsaken? The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. The Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. For a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. I'm going to invite you this morning. Right there where you're at. How about we just all stand on our feet? The word of God says, you find it in Ezekiel 37, when it talks about the valley of the dry bones. And he says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter into you and you will come to life. God is saying this morning, I will make breath enter into you and you will come to life. Maybe some of you have been struggling. Some of you have felt down. Some of you have felt dead. But God is saying, as we prophesy and as we begin to see dry bones awaken, God is saying, I will make breath enter into your body. I will make breath enter into your mind. I will make breath enter into your family. And you will live again. You shall live again. I hope you believe that word this morning and we're going to sing it again not for a minute has God forsaken us here we go for a minute was I forsaken the Lord is in this place the Lord is singing dry bones awaken dry bones awaken come Holy Spirit the Lord Welcome to Mana the Church, a place for you and your family. We're so excited to have you join us today. For now, let's look at our announcements. For this next week, our morning devotionals and HDR online will not be playing. If you want to watch them, you can tune in on our YouTube page. Ladies, we invite you at 7 p.m. on Monday nights to join us for a cell group with Pastora. Likewise, gentlemen, you can join us for our cell group with Pastor at 7 in Spanish and 
at 8 in English. If you're connecting with us for the first time and have a prayer request, we'd like to invite you to connect with us via our website or our church app. If you'd like to partner with us by giving to the ministry, you can follow the prompts that are going to be on the screen. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. And now it's time for the word. We ask you to open your heart and remember, Mananata is a place for you and your family. Hello, everybody, and God bless you today. I pray that all of you are well. I pray that all of you are doing good, that your family is well, uh, just walking and breathing and living under the protection of Jesus' blood that was shed for us. Do you believe that? You should, because it's a benefit that the Heavenly Father has provided for you in Christ Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And in him, we have it all for all eternity. And I just pray that you're doing well. God bless you. I'm Pastor Mario Sandoval here at Maranatha Church, where there's a place for you and all of your family. We know that God is interested in the family and that God cares about you and every individual and member of your family. And so the Bible says God will cause to dwell in among family those that are scattered of Israel. And so we believe that word for you and for me and for our church. Amen. Uh, also, I, wanna, I, can't get, I don't want to get started without first dealing with what we're going through right now. We need to pray for our country. Our country is in shambles and our country is bleeding in pain. And so this is a time that we as a church need to pray. Yes, yes, it is signs of the end of days. Without a doubt, we know that. We understand that. And, but it doesn't, it's not a time for us to be thinking about leaving. It's, about, it's a time for us to be thinking about working. What is our work? To continue to shine the light of Jesus, to continue to speak out, and begin to continue to share the good news of Jesus and to be a voice in the wilderness. This is a time that we need to humble ourselves, everybody. We need to all humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Uh, time to stand in the gap and intercede and pray and cry out to God with repentance. Uh, literally, our country is suffering the consequences of our sins. And so it's a time to humble ourselves cry out to God in prayer. The Bible says the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man, a person among them who would make a wall and stand in a gap before me on behalf of the land interceding, that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their need, deeds on their own heads, says the Lord of God. Well, I want you to know that God did find that man. And you know who that man is? The Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has paid the price, and he stood in the gap. So now you and I, the church, our city, need to identify with Jesus and what he's done for us and cry out to God with humble hearts and repentance uh, and pray for our nation, pray for our city, pray for our city, our city uh, governors, those that are governing over our city or our state, uh, that God will give them the wisdom and the strength that they need. And we are all leaders of all kinds, community leaders, uh, faith leaders, and uh, civil leaders. We need to come together and deal with this issue. There is no reason whatsoever for George Floyd to be dead. None whatsoever. 
with this, I want to express my deepest and most profound condolences to the family of George Floyd at this moment. This is a time that we, the church, need to raise our voice against racism, hate, injustice, injustices, and crimes committed against our black brothers and sisters. We, the church, need to be <coughs> excuse me, instruments of peace. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The Bible says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We need to be a voice. We need to be a help. We need to be a problem solver. We need to be a peacemaker. We need to acknowledge our sin. We need to confess our sin, and we need to repent of our sin. We can't have no more of this brutality going on can't have no more of this injustice going on and we all all of us need to stand up and make a change it's not about making noise it's about making a difference and so I want to pray right now uh, for this situation and also pray for our time in the word of God because God I believe has a message for us today father I just thank you right now because you always hear us not something that we deserve, but it's something that's been granted unto us by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, that you hear every prayer. And so right now, Lord, I come before you. On behalf of our nation, on behalf of the Floyd family, on behalf of all the people even that are protesting, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's anger. There's hatred. It's not even the things that have happened that has brought all this. It's the way trouble is dealt with. Sometimes we don't deal with it the right way. Your word says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Father, I pray right now that you forgive us as leaders. If those of us who uphold justice and righteousness we have failed and now we have a people full of wrath once again I say forgive them for they know not what they do heal our bleeding hearts heal our infected souls set us free God you are the one the only one that can set us free have mercy I pray for our civil leaders our faith leaders and all of those who have some type of influence whether it's the mother and father at a home, whether it's a coach on the players of his team, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a professor, whether it's the, the elderly man, the grandfather, the mother, the person in the neighborhood, the police officer, all of us that have some kind of leadership role, we ask you now to give us the grace, the wisdom, the humility, the passion, the courage to begin to get bring resolve to the issues that we're going through, each one of us in our sphere of influence to bring resolve, to put out the fires, but most of all, the fires that are burning in people's hearts. We ask for mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I ask you now that this word, this message, that it will go forth as the living word of God. Lord, piercing down to the very souls of each and of each one of us speaking to us and bringing the change, the change that you bring into our lives, into our homes, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, I pray that you be blessed and let us continue to trust in the Lord. The title of the message that I want to bring you today, I've titled it, Great Joy. Amen? Great Joy. And when you hear the word joy... What are the images that come to your mind when you hear that? A person laughing, a party, a celebration. Today, we're going to learn about a unique joy, a very distinguished joy. It's different than all other joys that most of us think about. It's unique. In the Bible, in James chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 2, 3, and 4 out of the New Living Translation. And... Uh, it says, James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Amen. I want to talk to you in this moment right now about the test is worth it. The test is worth it. Notice that I said it's not that the problem is worth it. The test is worth it. The scripture that we read talked about problem, talked about trouble. It says, uh, consider when troubles come your way. But then further on down in the text, it talks about the testing of your faith. So it's not the troubles that you go through that are worth it. It's not the problems that you're going through <coughs> that are worth it. It is the testing of your faith that is worth it. And the testing of your faith is when you choose, listen to this carefully, the testing of your faith in the problem the testing of your faith in the trouble is when you and I choose that in midst of the trial, in midst of the problem, in midst of the trouble, we're not going to give in to complaining. We're not going to give in to worrying. We're not going to let anxiety drown us. We're not going to let unbelief take over us. We're not going to give place to doubt. We're not going to give our voice to speak negative words, but we're going to choose in the midst of the trouble to use our faith. Amen. That's the testing of their faith. Did you know the Bible says that precious unto God, more precious to God than silver and gold is the, is the trial of your faith. God gets excited when our faith is being tested because that's when he is working in our lives. And so today we're talking about that we're talking about the test is worth it. And what makes it worth it is when you choose that in the midst of the trial to be a person of, 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 of faith and not a person of complaint, a person of doubt, a person of negative words. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a good example of this is the Hebrew, the Hebrew people that came out of the land of Egypt came out of save slavery when Moses set them free, used of God. Did you know the Bible says that um, Israel in the desert, they, they saw the works of God, but Moses knew his ways. <coughs> Very important statement. Uh, because Israel in the, uh, in the promised land, excuse me, Israel, if you notice that when they came out of the promised land, they were going through the desert. All they did was complain. All they did was murmur. All they did was speak unbelief and doubt. All they did was worry and, and allowed anxiety to take over them. They never allowed praise to come out of their mouth. Did you know the Bible says that your praises will be continually in my mouth? Praise is a lifestyle. Praise unto God is a lifestyle. It's not, it's not a part of the service. It's not something we, that, that, that is a part of our service. It's not, it's not a concert. No, praise is a part of our spiritual breathing. It's our life source. It's our life walk. And so Israel didn't praise the Lord. All they did was complain and complain and complain. And God's purpose was to take them into a promised land that he had already promised them and get prepared for them. But yet they never arrived there. They were never able to enter into there because of them choosing to not have faith. They didn't choose to have faith in the desert. They didn't choose to have faith in the wilderness. They chose to complain. So what they did is they just settled. Listen to this. What the Hebrew people did, they just settled and were complacent with just a memory of an experience that they saw in the wilderness. When they went through troubles and God did the miracles for them, all they did was just stay with the memory, but they didn't learn nothing. They didn't grow at all. They didn't take it in and try to see what I can get out of this. It's, but Moses was different. The Bible says he learned God's ways. Where did he learn it? Along the way. He learned it in the same things they went through. And so they came out of the situation just the same, but Moses each time was made better and better and better. He learned God's ways. Another scripture says that he learned that God revealed unto Moses his character. Moses learned God's ways and Moses grew in God's character. Ain't that, don't you think that's a gift that God would want to make us partakers of his character? What greater character is there than the character of God? And so the reason Israel never grew, <coughs> never prospered, 
It's because in the troubles, in the problems, they didn't choose to trust God. They didn't choose to learn. All they choose was to get out of the problem. And once the problem was over, they were just left with the memory of what God did. And how many people do you and I know that have seen miracles? They've seen God do things for them. But they, in their walk with God, have never grown. They're still in a place of unbelief. They're still in a place of doubt. They're still wondering, why. when is God going to do a miracle? If you notice the Israel, you think it's terrible, but the problem is that they never grew. They never grew. And so this leads me to my next point, development, development. In the scriptures that we read in James in verse uh, uh, 3 and 4, it says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so the tests, the trials that we go through are for development. It's a time of development. It's a time of growth. That's where we grow in the trials. The muscles don't grow unless they are pushed to its maximum ability. The muscles don't get any bigger unless they are forced to push beyond their ability. And so the Bible says for when, that when your faith is tested, not the trouble, but when your faith is tested, but your faith, for your faith to be tested, there has to be a trouble. There has to be a problem. Your endurance has a chance to grow. Your endurance has a chance to grow. Your ability, your strength has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, it's talking about maturity in the Lord, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, why be joyful about this? Where is the joy? This is not an emotional joy. That's where the uniqueness is. This is not an emotional joy. Usually when we think about joy, we think about emotion, and that is correct. But this is a different type of joy. This joy is not emotional. This joy is based on knowledge and understanding. This joy that I'm talking about is based, about, or based on what you know. It's on what you understand. It's not about what you feel. Instead, the joy is about what you know and what you understand. You know and understand about an opportunity that is taking place. Did you hear what I said? It's about an opportunity that is taking place. You're giving God an opportunity to work. The scripture that we have said, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So the joy is, co is connected to an opportunity and the opportunity is connected to the joy because you know what's going on. You know what's taking place. You know what God is doing. Your joy is not emotional. It is because of what God is doing in that situation. It's about what God is doing in your life. It's about what God is doing. Now, it's the opportunity that you give to God. Did you hear that? It's an opportunity that you give to God to continue his work in you and through you. The opportunity is not given to God. The opportunity is given to you for you then to give the opportunity to God so that he can continue to perfect his work that he began in your life. When God delivers you from a problem, it is because he want, is doing something for you. But when God chooses to deliver you through the problem, it's because he's doing something in you and through you. And we need to learn the difference. And so we need to understand. It's just like when a pregnant woman is about to give labor. In that time, there is pain. As a matter of fact, the emotion that is felt is pain and it brings affliction. But there is a joy because of what is happening. Not about what they're going through. It's about what is happening. What is happening? Life is being birthed. My baby is coming. I'm going to be able to carry my child. My baby is coming. And so there is a joy in the midst of that problem. The Bible says because of the joy awaiting him, speaking of Jesus, he endured the cross. Jesus didn't find joy in the cross. He wasn't on the cross joyfully. He wasn't up there singing hallelujah and praise the Lord. But he was joyful because of what the, the cross and the purpose of God in the cross was producing. You see, the joy is in what he knew and what he understands. It was a joy awaiting him. He knew about something in the future that was not being seen yet, but he knew where things were going. He understood what God was doing. He knew what God was trying to get to come. Now, he had a moment. He had a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it's possible, pass this cup from me. Is there another way? Is there another option to save mankind than me going to the cross? But then he said, but not my will. Let your will be done. And so what Jesus did is he gave God an opportunity 
to do a work through him for the salvation of all of mankind that all can come to faith in Jesus and be saved. It is important to remember this, that Jesus' suffering on the cross was not imposed upon him. He was not obligated or forced in any way to go to the cross. He said it himself. He said, nobody takes my life. I give it. He freely chose to go to the cross. The Bible says no discipline is, is enjoyable while it is happening. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Amen. Discipline is not enjoyable. It's painful. Nobody loves to work. Talking about from an athlete perspective, nobody likes to practice because in the practice, there's no joy. There's no applauses. There's no points. There's no there's no awards. There's no stats. It's only practice. But that's where the greatness of you is being formed at to be able to perform in the more mundane, the day of the game. And so discipline is not enjoyable. It's painful. But where is it painful at? It's painful in your flesh. It's painful in your flesh. The flesh is a place where there is a, a, a the flesh in, it, in, its, in, its, in its nature is selfish. It's always selfish. This is when you are a person that pursues your own personal interests. You're only seeking for your own personal convenience. It was not convenient for Jesus to go to the cross. And sometimes serving the Lord is not always convenient. It's not always seems to have a personal uh, reward for us at the moment. And so the flesh will always get in the way of God's purpose coming about and through your life, in your life and through your life. Because the flesh can only think about me, myself, and I. The flesh cannot consider anything else out. The flesh only cares about my convenience, my reward, my success, my personal interest. That's all it cares about. And so for God to fulfill his purpose in your life, you have to be willing to die to your flesh. You have to be willing to crucify your flesh on the cross and let God will be done in your life. Discipline is not enjoyable. It's painful. The test of your faith is what produces character. You don't mature because you get older in age. You mature because you pass the test. You mature because you pass the test because you choose to exercise your faith in the test. And when you exercise your faith in your test, you give God complete access. Did you hear what I said? You give God complete access to move in the situation and to move on your behalf and to bring glory to his name and to bring blessings to all those who are open to him. The, the, the test of your faith brings a complete and balanced development. It causes you to grow in a balanced way. There are people that are successful in one area, but they are not successful in another area. They have a great company, but they don't have their family. Uh, there's people who have uh, that, are, that are real smart and very intelligent to capture things, but they don't have the discipline to submit themselves to a job. They don't have the discipline to submit themselves to a, to a lifestyle of discipline. And so, therefore, the Bible says when you allow God to take you to the test, you lack nothing. God wants to take you and I to a place where we lack nothing. God has a blessing for you. And he has a blessing for me. But we need to learn to find the joy in the, in the, in the trouble, the joy in the fire, because otherwise you're not going to be blessed. You can't be a person that's always about your emotions. You can't be a person that's only about your feelings. Feelings and emotions are a part of our lives. They're a part of our makeup. God gave them to us to enjoy. It's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's your taste buds in life that helps you to savor things. But you don't never allow your taste buds to be the thing that determines what you do. It's just like how, much, how many times has medicine that is good for you doesn't taste so good? How many people don't eat vegetables because they don't taste so good? A lot of times we eat what, what, we, what is tasty, but we don't always eat what is good for us. And so... We need to not be people of emotions. We have emotions and we allow our emotions to help us enjoy life, but emotions do not dictate our life. The word of God dictates our life and our submission to the word of God dictates our life. And so I want to encourage you today to open your heart and to give God the opportunity to work in your life. You see, the joy is that the, it's an opportunity 
for you to give God an opportunity to fulfill and to perfect the good work that it began in your life. The Bible says, he who began the good work in your life shall perfect it. But he needs your, your, your permission to do so. I want to read a scripture to you in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 18. And I want to talk to you now about true riches. True riches. The Bible says, it says, and this is Jesus speaking here. I know all the things you do. That you are neither hot nor cold. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit out of spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And you, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I want you to notice in this scripture the difference of opinions in this passage, there is a personal opinion and then there's God's opinion. And I want you to also note that the opinions are contrast to one another. The personal opinion is completely different than God's opinion. And so the, the personal opinion is that I'm rich, I'm blessed, I don't need anything, I have everything, I'm fulfilled, I am successful, and the list goes on. And then God's opinion about the same opinion is different. Is that no, you're not. He says, no, you're not. He goes, uh, he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, you say that. He goes, but I, he says, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then God goes on to say, I want to invite you. And then the Lord speaks about true riches. He says, uh, I want to invite you to buy gold from me. But gold that has been purified in fire. The true riches are found in the fire. Did you notice that? Not just any gold. He goes, yeah, you have gold, but I have a gold that is different than the gold that you have. The gold that I have is a greater gold. And so he says, I want to invite you to buy from me gold purified purified and fire. Now notice that the Lord is the one who offers the gold, but it's us. We are the ones that choose to buy the gold. He makes it available. He makes an invitation. He makes an offer unto us to buy the true riches, to have true riches, to have the greatest, the best riches, the best gold, but it's something that we have to choose to buy. How do you buy it? You don't buy it with money. You don't buy it with works. You buy it by surrendering your will when you say, yes, Lord. When Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. That's when God does a work that nobody else can do. Now, you must choose to do that. It's your choice. That's why I said that God gives you an opportunity to give him an opportunity to do his work in your life. Unless you, he can give you the opportunity, the opportunity is there. But then if you don't turn around and then give him the opportunity, then he can't work. Because God has given you something, and this is the vow of his love. He's given you a free will. And so he's never going to violate that free will. He's never going to try to manipulate your free will. He's never going to impose his will upon your will. It's always going to be an invitation. It's always going to be an opportunity. But when you understand, but who wants to choose to go to the fire? Why did Jesus at the end of his prayer say, not my will, but your will be done? Because he he saw the joy in what was happening. He knew the joy that was ahead. He knew what was going It was not an emotional thing. It was a thing about knowledge, had to do with knowledge and understanding. And so he chose because he trusted the Father. Now, the reason that the Lord is the one that offers the best gold is because only he can convert the plans of destruction 
into a blessing. Did you know that? Only he can take a trial that was to destroy you, a trouble that was supposed to tear you down, a problem that was supposed to destroy everything you have. He can use that and turn it into a blessing for you. Only God can convert the devil's plans of destruction into plans of prosperity. A great example of this is the story of the three Hebrew boys that were put into a fiery furnace. That fiery furnace was ignited, it was prepared with the sole purpose to destroy them, to kill them. And God <laughs> used what the devil planned, God used what the devil orchestrated, God took, used, imposed his will upon the devil's will, and he turned what was to be for destruction into a place of protection, a place of blessing, a place of prosperity. Because the Bible says that once when that, that, that flame, they were protected in there. Nobody could touch them. Nobody could even come near them because the flames now were a shield of protection. Amen. And the, the point was that Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, can you guys come out of the fiery furnace? Because they couldn't go in there and get them. They had to invite them to come out. And when they came out of the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar lifted them up and placed them in a place of high honor. And then he declared that their God was going to be now their God. That the God of the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, was now going to be the God of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. You see how God can turn it around? But they had to choose to buy the gold purified in fire because there was a threat and they were put in a place of challenge and they were put in a place of trouble. And the trouble was that there was an edict declared that if everyone, Nebuchadnezzar had built a statue and everybody who did not bow before the statue would be executed. And they chose to not bow before the statue because God says, do not bow before any image or idols. And when Nebuchadnezzar heard about it, he threatened him and says, if you don't bow, we're going to throw you into this fire, fire, fire furnace. You will be executed. And their response was, God has the power to deliver us. But if he chooses not to, we are not going to bow. In other words, they said, Father, not our will, but your will be done. If there's a possibility of being brought out of this situation, being delivered from this situation, that's what we want. But if not, we're going to have to go through it. And did you know that sometimes we have to go through some things? And the promise is not that you won't go through it. The promise is that you're going to come out of it. That's where the promise is at. The promise is not, oh, not every promise is, not, not, is that God's not going to allow you to go through things. There's promises that God says, when you go through the fire, it won't burn you. When you go through the river, you won't drown. You're going to come out on the other side. And so sometimes we all go through stuff. People have gone through cancer. People have gone through divorce. People have gone through bankruptcy. People have gone through the loss of a loved one. Our country is going through things right now. So what do we do? We, the body of Christ, need to, to exercise our faith in this time. We need to be a voice. We need to be a helping hand. We need to be a brother and a sister. We need to be a father and a mother. We need to be somebody. We need to exercise our faith. Somebody representing the kingdom of God. What the devil meant for bad, God can turn it to good if you choose to buy the gold tried in fire. If you give God an opportunity, if you take the opportunity that he's given you and you give it back to him, then he can do a work in your life. God is working. And the true goal, the true test, the joy in the test is not the emotional feeling. It's not what you feel. It's not what, what you're going through. It's what God is going to do. And when you choose to say, I'm going to trust God. It's not the problem in itself. It's not just going through stuff. There's people who go through stuff all the time, but they never learn like Israel. They never learn. They never grow. They never choose to be like God. They just complain until the storm is over. And they continue the same. But when you choose in the problem, when you choose in the trial, when you choose in the affliction to honor God, to praise God in spite of, when you choose to honor his word and you choose to speak his promises and not speak defeat, when you choose to speak his word and not speak what you're just feeling, when you choose to stand on his promise and believe his word, then you're giving God an opportunity. 
to give you the best goal. And every trial that you go through and that you come out through the way you're supposed to, <coughs> you will be blessed. It's not the problem. It's the test of your faith in the problem that's going to take you to a better place and make you a better person. So I invite you today, right now, that you choose this moment to no longer complain. That it's not easy. It's not easy. I felt that when I said it. It's not easy. But that you choose to make it an endeavor that I'm going to choose to, to trust God. I'm going to choose to, God, what do you want me to learn in this situation? God, what are you trying to teach me in this situation? God, what are you trying to mold in my life? What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to give up? What do you want me to embrace? What do you want me to, to, to practice? Maybe there's something that God is trying to get you to learn that you really didn't think you needed to learn. But God has got you learning something and you don't really care to learn it because it's not valuable at this moment. But God knows how valuable it's going to be in the future. And so when you choose to have faith instead of complaining, then you give God an opportunity to work in your life and to work through your life. And God has the power to take what the devil meant for bad and turn it to good. That's where that scripture comes in. And all things work to good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Those people who put God where they love before everything and those people that embrace his purpose above their own selfish desires and they put God's purpose above their own personal interests and they trust him. You know, many people misunderstand that when God says, give up your interests, give up your, your, your desires, that that means throw it in the trash. No, you don't need to throw it in the trash. Your dreams are precious to God. Your desires are precious to the Lord. Your wants are precious to the Lord. What you do is you choose to give your personal interests. You choose to give your personal desire. You choose to give your personal dreams and you place them in God's hands. And he grabs them and he holds on to them fulfills his purpose and in due season he knows when he'll bring it to pass now the reason he asks you to put it in his hand is because your dream is his will because your desire is his desire but you got to put it in his hands you got to say God I believe you'll bring it to pass you have to believe that's why the love of God is so important because it's the love of God that casts out fear how many times we don't make the right decision because we're afraid of losing out on something that we want well, you got to know that God loves you enough that he cares about you to that, that you are that precious and that you are that valuable to him that he's not going to belittle your dreams. He's going to grab hold of it. He's going to cherish it like a treasure box. He's going to hold it dear in his heart and in due season, he'll bring it to pass in your life. But God's purpose is greater than life. And so you can't make your life about your life. You got to make it about God's purpose because God's purpose is greater than life. And God's purpose blesses generations to come. So I invite you right now to open your heart. I invite you right now to receive what God is speaking to you. I invite you right now to repent and say, Holy Spirit, I repent from complaining all the time. I invite you right now to say, Lord, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Even in the trials and the tribulations. You know, the trials and tribulations can be so overwhelming. But when you find the joy the joy found in and the joy based on what you know that God is doing, when you understand what God is doing, when you know what's ahead, when you know where it's taking you, just like a mother in labor, there's a joy in the midst of it all that you will let God bring his purpose to pass in your life. Otherwise, God can't bring his purpose to, to pass in your life because you're not allowing him to. Say this prayer with me right there where you're at. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me the way you do. Thank you for the purpose, the great purpose you have for my life. Forgive me from doing things in my own ability, thinking that I can bring to pass your purpose in my life. I choose this moment to surrender to you. Come into my life, not just into my moment. Come into my life and be the Lord of my life and help me now, Holy Spirit, to see joy caused by what I know. The joy caused because of what God promised to do. And not just be about the emotion. The joy that is found in understanding and knowing your ways. I surrender my life to you and I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior and the Lord of my life. Amen. And amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. I believe that if you said that prayer with all your heart and with faith, that something great 
was birthed today in your life. It's called the new birth in Christ Jesus. And I want you to know that Maranatha Church is a place for you and your family. That we're here for you. And we're going to encourage you. As long as God gives us breath, we're going to breathe the word of God over your life. And encourage you as much as we can. We pray that you have a great day. And let us continue to pray. And cry out to God for our nation. For our city. We're in the test. We're in a trial. It's not time to complain. It's a time to exercise our faith on the word of God. God bless you. And God be with you.